Um, it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce a colleague and friend and someone I think everyone or many of you know, Walter Park. So uh, Dr. Park is uh, uh, part of the GI department at Stanford. He's the medical director of the benign pancreas program and has really made a name and a reputation for himself as a thought leader in the world of the pancreas. Um, I think he also serves as the current president of CAPER, which is uh, Pancreas Alliance. It's the collaborative alliance for pancreas education and research, a national organization, and they put on national conferences as well. So we're very lucky to have him in our backyard, also lucky to have him as a return speaker here. Thanks, Walter. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank Eric and the leadership as well as the organizers for inviting me to be here. I um, also want to thank you for allowing me to follow Dr. Chopra from going from high level thinking to back to kind of the, the nuts and bolts of some of the organs we study in our specialty. Um, so I'm going to, my, my charge is to, in the next 20 to 30 minutes, is give you an update and what's been going on in the field of clinical pancreas, um, in my opinion, a lot. But given the time, I'm going to try to be somewhat targeted and selective about what I think has been going on. And to the extent that this is a post-DDW symposium, I've identified a few abstracts that kind of pick up on some themes that I think have been trending lately in our field. So these are my disclosures, um, of which I do not think any of these pertain to today's talk. So I'm going to touch upon um, what are basically the four major categories of what I see in my clinical practice as well as in my research. Uh, that involves where are we with acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, uh, pancreatic cysts, and pancreatic cancer screening. And I'll just kind of briefly touch on each of them in terms of some major themes along with um, any potential related abstracts that I saw this year. So with acute pancreatitis, I think many of you may be familiar with um, the recent AGA guidelines that came on that came out in 2018 on the initial management of acute pancreatitis. And I just wanted to highlight a couple management points that I think were perhaps um, underappreciated or I want um, or would like to continue to restate as I think are important concepts in terms of what we are where we're thinking with acute pancreatitis. And as many of you know, uh, biliary pancreatitis is one of the more common causes. Um, and, what, and, and it's always been a general teaching that if they have acute biliary pancreatitis, uh, in the absence of cholangitis, there really is no uh, indication for an urgent ERCP during that hospitalization. And I think this was just stressed, and the data behind that seems to be supported by eight different RCTs about the role of ERCP. Um, there was an abstract that was actually presented uh, at the AGA plenary uh, this past year, um, done of a multi-center randomized clinical trial done by the Dutch group. The Dutch uh, pancreatitis group has, um, is a consortium of 26 centers that basically make up the whole country of the Netherlands, and they've uh, several years ago decided to organize themselves in a way that have allowed them to do some landmark studies that otherwise would not have been possible. Um, some of it's driven by the fact of how their healthcare is structured and some of the incentivizations that allow them to do this. But as a consequence, they've, they've really moved the field forward in severe acute pancreatitis management. And so um, this is one of their more recent studies. And this was an, um, the, the question was really in a patient who has acute biliary pancreatitis, if it's mild and, and there's no evidence of cholangitis, that makes sense to provide supportive care. But what if the patient is showing signs of severe disease and you're really worried about the evolution of persistent organ failure or necrosis? Uh, and, and in the absence of cholangitis, is there a role for doing uh, an ERCP? And that was the main clinical question here. And so this was a, um, um, as I said, uh, um, so their inclusion criteria was evidence of a biliary etiology, predicted severe disease. I apologize for that typo um, with autocorrect. I, I, I missed that. So, and defined by CRP of greater than 150, an IMRI score of greater than 2, which is essentially a surrogate of SIRS, or a PACHI 2 score of greater than 7, another sense of SIRS is what I would say. Obviously, if they had cholangitis, they would need an ERCP, so these patients were excluded. Uh, they used a composite primary outcome of severe complications including persistent organ failure, which is the definition of severe acute pancreatitis, the presence of, cholang uh, uh, the, the presence of cholangitis, the evolution of cholangitis, bacteremia, pneumonia, pancreatic ne necrosis, or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and finally, death. 
you know, in some of these trials, when you have limited outcome incidents of outcomes, you know, what you do is you do these composite outcomes as a way to make the sample size more manageable. And so we see a lot of that in the severe acute pancreatitis trials because it's hard to enroll these patients. Um, but they were able to enroll 232 patients, which they randomized to uh, uh, early, EM, uh, early ERC with sphincterotomy versus um, conservative therapy. And while there was a, um, a slight reduction in the primary composite outcome of 39% versus 44%, um, and this was only seen in cholangitis, it wasn't clinically significant. So their conclusion was even in this setting where there's a, a, a strong temptation to want to do ERC with good intention, the data, at least according to this trial, did not show that these patients sit, um, benefited. One of the other management points in the AGA guidelines that I'd like to draw your attention to that I think is somewhat paradigm changing because I think when many of us think about acute pancreatitis, our immediate ref reflex is supportive care, and that often means keeping the patient NPO for one to three to four days until the patient's ready to eat. And I think the more recent uh, cumulative data has kind of shown that our fears about refeeding them too soon are probably unfounded, and it probably doesn't hurt the patient as much as we think. And so I, I give kudos to, to the, the, the Standards of Practice Committee in, in making the statement that early within 24 hours, oral feeding rather than keeping patient NPO is actually recommended. So what this looks like really is when a patient gets admitted with acute pancreatitis, you don't actually put an NPO order. You can actually say they can eat if they wish. Now, that doesn't mean the patient will eat. That doesn't mean you're necessarily telling the patient to eat. What you're just basically saying is a diet order is acceptable, and if the patient feels hungry, they can go ahead and try it. So this often doesn't limit. Um, um, the, the data behind this seems to suggest that there's no difference in mortality. Uh, in fact, earlier feeding leads to lowered infection rates and lower risks of multi-organ failure. And you don't necessarily even have to start with a clear liquid diet. Um, there have been some nice studies that show that low-fat solid diet as the starting diet is probably just as fine with Without any further harms, and in fact, patients got discharged one day earlier. So I think this is somewhat paradigmatic change because we're so reflexively NPO, 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 and um, trying to get our residents uh, at our own hospital to say, you know what, it's actually okay to just keep a diet order. Again, that doesn't mean we want them to eat. Most of these patients who are feeling nauseous and having pain won't eat, but basically, you're giving them a train saying, if you feel up for nibbling, go ahead and get started. Um, and I think the other quality improvement point is I think we've all known that these patients need cholecystectomies, and I think there's been a variation in practice in terms of the timing of doing a cholecystectomy, and we've seen variation in surgical care where there's concern that in the setting of acute inflammation that a patient uh, should probably be discharged and come back as an outpatient when they're more stable for their outpatient elective cholecystectomy. And it turns out that uh, it's, it, you know, the, the statement here is we really should push our surgical colleagues and have frank conversations with them that, you know what, uh, we should really try to get this cholecystectomy done before discharge. And I think uh, more and more this is going to become a quality measure uh, for, uh, as a standard of care. So I'm going to move on to chronic pancreatitis. Now, there are many different aspects that we could talk about chronic pancreatitis, including the role and use of um, pancreatic enzymes, the risk of pancreas cancer, the era of in this era of opioid reduction, how, how do we manage these patients with non-opioids. Um, but I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about the maintenance aspects of chronic pancreatitis for today's discussion. And that's really about recognizing um, the role of osteoporosis. I think many of us are aware about the, the risk of osteoporosis in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and some other small um, gut disorders, notably from fat malabsorption. You know, with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, there is low vitamin D malabsorption. But in addition to that mechanism, there's also increased bone turnover related to systemic inflammation. And this is thought to account as a mechanism for the high prevalence of osteoporosis, up to 30% of patients in your chronic uh, pancreatitis patients. And more recent guidelines, including the Europeans, have recommended that there should be baseline bone density scanning every two to three years if it's normal, along with annual vitamin D testing. Um, so I just wanted to raise this as, uh, um, you know, many of you may be managing your chronic pancreatitis patients and they're doing fine, and there are some maintenance issues that you basically want to do, and it, like we talk about in IBD, similarly, I think for patients with chronic pancreatitis, they should also, you should consider bone density testing. And this was an abstract done um, by the Brigham group, and they're a fairly large tertiary center uh, under the tutelage of uh, Peter Banks there, and really just asking the question, do patients with chronic pancreatitis receive optimal bone health care? 
And this was a retrospective study that they did within their own institution of 478 chronic pancreatitis patients. Bone, um, bone density testing was uh, done in 52%, uh, where 30% had osteoporosis, and vitamin D testing was done in 82%. So even in an institution, that is, that is somewhat of a thought-leading institution about chronic pancreatitis management. They even identified their own gaps in forgetting to actually get these tested for their patients. So this is, I think, a quality gap. And in, as we enter these areas of quality measures, uh, when we talk about pancreatic disorders, uh, this will probably be one of those, as it is for IBD. Pancreatic cysts. Um, so in the last two years, these are the number of guidelines that have come out, and this is like metadata to just say, you know, how much of an issue this has become for many of our practicing gastroenterologists. Our societies have responded in saying that our members want information, they want guidance, they want value on this, so each society has taken upon themselves to go ahead and form their own practice committee, do their own uh, uh, due diligence, um, and publish these different guidelines. And, in some way, you would hope that consensus would be achieved. And for the most part, there's a lot of similarity than, than differences. But um, I, I think that having all these different guidelines also, in some way, with their nuanced differences, can contribute to some of the confusion out there. Perhaps the most provocative were the AGA guidelines in 2015. Um, they did a phenomenal job in doing a technical expert review. Um, and kudos to them in that regard. Uh, and the conclusion really was that the, the design of much of the data was somewhat poor, so they couldn't really make strong statements. However, that didn't really stop the committee from making certain medical position statements. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly why, but th they had their own intentions. And some of them probably weren't supported by the data, specifically the controversial idea of stopping screening after five years. It's, it's, it's clear that the, many of these cysts are indolent, and they do grow slowly. But we just don't know enough about the natural history to discharge a patient from clinic. Um, I, I would say it's akin to discharging a patient who you know has a colon polyp and just saying you don't need a colonoscopy anymore because it's pretty small. Probably they'll be fine. But it, it's, the same, it's the same kind of metaphor that I would say I don't think we know enough to really know who we can properly and safely discharge. Um, in terms of where we are moving, there's been a lot of, as a consequence of this interest and, and the need to, clar to seek clarity, there's been a lot of research on pancreatic cysts um, and much driven endoscopically in terms of whether we can ablate these, whether we can uh, do in vivo histology with OCT, whether we can develop new biopsy forceps and new needles that would allow us to get a more reliable tissue diagnosis. So these are all things that are underway. Um, I think another thing that I think is not entirely new, but is the real the genesis of, of uh, molecular uh, typing using the cyst fluid, um, which kind of came about about 10 years ago um, and has continued to evolve. And I think it's, I, I would submit that, you know, uh, that we're at a point where molecular analysis is really uh, a clinical driver and, and is a big part of my clinical practice now in terms of differentiating and restratifi restratifying these pancreas cysts. This really moves beyond uh, your standard CEA or your amylase or your cytology. Um, and so I think what is clear now is that intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, the, more, the most common of the pre-malignant pancreatic cysts generally harbor KRAS and GNAS mutations. Mucinous cystic neoplasms have KRAS. Cyrocyst adenomas uh, often are associated with von Hippel-Lindau, uh, and you can see that mutation in, in, in cyrocysts. Um, CTNNB1 is commonly seen in solitude of papillary neoplasms, and the absence of any of these mutations often imply a non-neoplastic cyst. So there have been several studies that have been done, um, one, at the, uh, one led by uh, Johns Hopkins and then others by the University of Pittsburgh, really now trying to kind of put, organize this data into, into a grid about whether if you have these mutations and how you can use that. And I think the data seems to strongly show that now with KRAS and GNAS alone and uh, with testing, we fairly good sensitivity and specific for cyst type. So I think we're, we're, the, the, the general approach is we need to know what cysts we're dealing with because based on clinical and radiographic data, we can assume that we're talking about an IPMN or we can assume we're talking about an MCN or a Cirrus but we're only right about 60 to 70% of the time. We're actually wrong about 30%. So we, there still is a clear need to be able to say, okay, Mrs. Smith has an IPMN and we are 99.9% .9 sure of it because either we see it in the cytology or we can see it in their DNA analysis. And I think we're basically there in that regard. So we can basically, we move the needle forward in that we have ways to confidently say what cysts we're dealing with. 
Now the question that allows us to then better and more accurately study the natural history and then identify those that have high grade uh, dysplasia. And those are the cysts that we really want to hone in on and operate. So um, using this molecular panel, which is the pancreas seq panel from uh, developed at the University of Pittsburgh, which is actually commercially or clinically available. You can actually get it done at the University of Pittsburgh, and that's actually where I do most of my, I send for most of my genetic testing. Um, so KRAS and GNAS is helpful, but now we're starting to identify markers that are going to help us differentiate high-grade dysplasia, uh, dysplasia, including P53, PIK3CA, and P10, and you can, ha you can see they have some fairly good sensitivity and specificity markers. We're not there yet, and there's a lot of interesting uh, horses, uh, biomarkers that have been published uh, that are um, there, but that is the holy grail. We're trying to identify among the cysts where, where is our high-grade dysplasia, uh, and there's a lot of collaborative research undergoing, including what's called a bake-off that the NIH is funding, where different groups have published their data, and we're all throwing it in and um, and, and, and assessing our performance on the same blind da um, blinded data set. So I think there's a lot of interesting movement in that regard. Uh, and this was a, a follow-up, actually, abstract from the Hopkins group. Um, the other dimension to this is now, can we take the clinical information, can we take the imaging information, can we take the genetic information from the cis fluid, and then overlap that with essentially supervised machine learning, another big theme in the practice of medicine, of what is the role of enhanced intelligence or artificial intelligence. And this is uh, something that they did using their cohort of their genetically studied patients. They then developed a, an algorithm um, and basically categorize cysts into those that require surgery, those that need monitoring, and those who can be further discharged from your clinic. And this is just an example of one of the algorithms that's out there, and their abstract, which is um, presented at the ASGE plenary, basically showed that the use of this COMSYS program would have reduced unnecessary surgery by 60 percent. So I think that, I don't think this will be the end all. I think what you'll see is a growing trend of different algorithms that will complement the, the, the cis fluid data as well as the clinical and imaging data, and it'll uh, help us make better decisions. So pancreatic cancer screening, um, I'll end on this. Um, so many of you know that the United States Preventive Service Health Service Task Force came out with saying that we, for pancreatic cancer screening for the average risk gets a grade D. Basically, we shouldn't do it, and, I, and there's no dispute about that. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot of interest, and perhaps they, they responded to that because there's been growing interest about pancreas cancer screening. You know, with colon cancer screening, uh, we started to bend the curve. Lung cancer screening with non-con CT scans, we're starting to bend the curve. And as you can see, pancreas and liver cancer seem to be growing, while other major cancers seem to be going down in incidence. Um, and uh, with this mindset, we also know that although pancreas adenocarcinoma is a refractory and horrible disease to get, the, the, in, in part we all know this is because of the late stage of presentation and that if you do find these um, earlier and you can identify these and, and shift the stage of diagnosis, even though there isn't a cure, you can see the five-year overall survival rate is significantly better at 20 to 25 percent. So while that's not um, uh, where we should be satisfied with, it just shows that if that there is evidence that if, uh, if we can detect these earlier, that would potentially um, move the needle forward. Um, so there is a, a growing interest in pancreas cancer screening, but we're not really focusing on the average risk population. We're really focused on the high risk populations. And to be clear, the US PTSF did not make any comments about high risk individuals. Their comment was strictly limited to average risk individuals. So, um, but there's been a lot of interest in the last decade or so about how do we screen patients who are at higher risk, those who have a strong family history of pancreas cancer, those who carry the BRCA1 or 2 mutation, the CDKN2A, or puts Jaegers. And these are um, three or four different studies that I put into table format that kind of shown um, the populations that they've been prospectively following, the different choices of tests, and then the clinical relevant lesions. And, and the general consensus to date is that it does seem to be working. Now, ultimately, what you'd want to do is show a decrease in mortality, and that's obviously much, much harder to do and took many, many decades for colon cancer to even get to a certain point. Um, I borrowed this slide from the pancreatic cyst. Um, table that my colleague Anne Marie Lennon put in a review article, but the but the point of this is I wanted to show is the the basic paradigm here is what we're trying to do, and the main strategy is a filtering strategy of t trying to prioritize the populations that you want to screen. So these are going to be patients who have pancreatic cysts, patients who have a strong family history, and patients who carry hereditary genetic mutation. 
then you want to focus on what is going to be our detection strategy. Uh, currently, it's endoscopic ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging, but are there other ways we can? Um, uh, there's a lot of promise in CT and cell free DNA. There's been some nice studies with using the pancreatic juice from secretin stimulation. Um, and can we develop new biomarkers that would further risk stratify the population, leading to then in some type of intervention? So um, the International Cancer of the Pancreas Screening Consortium is a, is a, a group of people that met um, back in 2012 uh, to get together because, frankly, the data is somewhat limited. And so you know, we're at a stage of basically consensus building and essentially doing Delphi process voting on where we are in, in syncing the data. And this was a publication that came out in 2013 in GUT in terms of who should be screened. Um, and again, this is not saying that having one mutation or having one first degree relative doesn't increase your risk compared to the general population. It's basically saying how do we really identify those who are most at risk to make a screening program or a screening approach most effective from a research perspective. And so um, basically they said two affected family members with at least one first degree relative, puts Jaeger syndrome, BRCA2, PALB2, P16, I would also add ATM, Lynch syndrome with a plus one affected first degree relative or the presence of hereditary pancreatitis. I will say that this group actually just met this past year. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be a part of it and actually will be publishing in, in 2000 uh, in, in the fall, the, the second round. Um, there hasn't been too many changes. I think the one discussion point was when do you start screening? Uh, and it, when looking at the data, um, I think the general consensus is at age 50 or 10 years younger than your first degree affected uh, family member. Um, there's been a lot of interest, um, so I have just basically been telling you that a lot of the focus has been on the high-risk families or the high-risk individuals, um, but in the last um, decade or so, a colleague of mine, Dr. Suresh Chari, who was at the Mayo, who's now at MD Anderson, has been really interested in the role of diabetes as a, as a surrogate or a perineoplastic phenomenon of pancreas cancer, and he's done a series of different studies that really kind of changed our thinking about um, uh, trying uh, the role of diabetes and pancreas cancer. Um, and this, in this study, uh, was a, um, he basically showed that in the, oh, sorry, in blue, how do I go back? Yes, yeah, okay. So this blue line are patients, uh, are um, 219 cases of pancreas cancer in their registry, and then red is just controls, and you can see at the time of diagnosis, uh, the, the prevalence of diabetes uh, or their sugar levels, and, and they were able to meticulously go back in their charts to see what their glucose levels were. And basically, the idea here is that um, for some, for, for most of these patients with pancreas cancer, uh, their diabetes, um, uh, the development of their diabetes was, a, was a, essentially a symbol uh, or a surrogate of their uh, of evolving pancreas cancer. And it's been estimated that 1% of subjects greater than 50 years with new onset diabetes will actually, while the vast majority of them have just type 2 diabetes, 1% of these will uh, actually, that new onset of diabetes is actually the beginnings of pancreas cancer. And in certain series, when you actually identify and resect the tumor, the diabetes actually goes away. So it, it, re, it is a, essentially a perineoplastic phenomenon. Um, and so that's generated a lot of interest. There's been some validation studies on some of these earlier studies um, in some of the larger population data sets. Kaiser Permanente Southern California looked at their data set. They didn't see as high as 1%, but they report about 0.5, 0 0.6%. So it's a small, but it's a real percentage. And it's been essentially the backbone. The NCI has been very interested in, 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 in studying this because, in theory, this could potentially be the beginnings of how do we start to stratify an average, a purported average risk population to begin uh, pancreas cancer screening. And this is just a, a, another study by Chari showing that the, uh, the prevalence of diabetes um, when you, uh, and you look at different, di different types of cancers is unusually higher in pancreas cancer. Now, this is any type of diabetes, even if they had that for 10 or 15 years. So having, it's, it's been known that diabetes itself is a risk factor for the development of pancreas cancer in large epidemiological studies, as it has been shown in other uh, uh, cancers. But what's interesting here is the prevalence of new onset diabetes is significantly higher than the same cancers, saying that there's a, a certain dynamic effect here um, that we could possibly um, leverage on this observation that maybe these are the patients we really need to think a little bit harder about. Uh, there was an abstract on Saturday at DDW that said, well, gee, if these glycemic profiles are evident in the sporadic average risk population, what about in the familial pancreatic cancer patients that we've already been saying that these are the ones we should be studying? And so the Mayo group just looked 
back at their tumor registry of patients with PDAC and a family history of PDAC, and they identified 236 patients in their study. There was no difference in the DM prevalence in uh, familiar pancreas cancer patients versus sporadic pancreas patients, 50 to 47 percent, as well as prediabetes and normal glycemia. So their conclusion was that perhaps as we even think about the higher risk patient populations, we should overlay the presence of new onset diabetes in terms of who we should be really concerned about for uh, early pancreas cancer. So I think what we're, uh, what I'm trying to convey to you again is we're, we're chipping away at trying to identify actionable risk factors, uh, diabetes, family history, uh, to then start to further risk stratify and say who uh, among the elderly should we start looking for, uh, start screening for pancreas cancer. Um, the other thing about this genetic testing and the hereditary, the high-risk population is that the NCCN guidelines for pancreas cancer uh, came out with the statement that if a patient is newly diagnosed with pancreas cancer, they should undergo genetic testing, even though they may not have a family history, because up to 15% of purported sporadic cases of pancreas cancer carry an underlying mutation such as BRCA2 uh, or CDKN2A that were just never diagnosed, and they're perhaps de novo mutations. And so that is a standard of care that oncologists are now doing for all newly diagnosed pancreas cancer. And, if you, and, and, and we've been seeing an uptick as a consequence of a change of that practice. Our high-risk clinic has just basically um, exploded in terms of our growth. And because the, once you identify a patient, that has implications for cascade testing. So then you test your family members. And then, and then they're identified. And now, if a family member carries that mutation, they already have a first-degree relative now who has pancreas cancer. So in a sense, we're, uh, I, I do, through this detection bias or change of practice, we're growing our high-risk population. It's larger than we thought. Uh, and so I think in that sense, there's a lot of um, movement in terms of uh, the, the field of uh, pancreas cancer screening. So um, I think the take-home points from my um, uptake is um, for acute pancreatitis, go ahead and feed them early. For chronic pancreatitis, screen for osteoporosis. For pancreatic cysts, I think we, we've uh, matured into this field of molecular testing, uh, and pancreas cancer screening is of increasing interest. Think about uh, your patients with new onset diabetes over the age of 50, particularly who are losing weight as opposed to gaining weight. These are the patients we'd want to be thinking a little bit about. This is just a shameless plug of the different research studies that we have ongoing for patients with chronic pancreatitis, new onset diabetes, and some molecular imaging trials for pancreas cancer. Thank you.